Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Listener, I'm very happy to be sharing with you the story of our guest today, the delightful Suze from Muckmat, who you'll hear more about shortly. She has got me thinking so much about the immense pressure we put on ourselves to find success as quickly as possible in our businesses and all of the micro moments of pain that that can put on us, that hustle that we really just want this to happen definitely a Kim problem right now, but maybe one for you too, where you're so passionate about all the things and working so hard that you just want to reach some of those milestones already. But one thing we can't control is the pace at which our journey moves. We just have to keep on showing up. In this episode today, you're going to hear all about setting your own pace as well as making a product that solves a problem in your life and turning it into a business. Starting with a low risk model, learning the ins and outs of e-com and marketing, navigating wholesale without having a plan for it, the reality of competitors and copycats, the personal price you pay throughout the growing period, and the craziest story I've heard of an absolute hell moment that almost destroyed Suze's business. So much value and insight coming for you. So please don't forget to share this show with your business buddies, share the love and support me to grow so I can keep bringing you more. Let's get into it. I'm here with Suzanne Horton, founder and director of Muckmat, which is every Aussie's favorite patch of grass. Now, let me explain. If you're an avid camper, a regular caravaner or keen beach goer, you'll know that the joyful time spent outside can quickly be forgotten when you have a sandy, dirty, mucky mess to deal with in the car or at home. Muckmat is specifically designed to thoroughly clean your feet post-outdoor adventure so you can always return to a satisfyingly clean car, tent, caravan and home. It was a creation born from a need with two boys and a shared love of being active outside. And after creating a DIY prototype that garnered a lot of attention, it became a business. Muckmat has since been featured by Sunrise, News.com.au Today, Smart Company, Anaconda and more and loved by thousands of adventurous humans. Being the founder of her own product company may not have been on the bingo card, but I bet it's been a wild adventure. Suze, welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thank you, Kim. Lovely to be here. It's good to have you. And I can't uh, go past mentioning the boys uh, up front, the messy boys, who you did say are um, out surfing at the moment and may come in and interrupt our recording. But I would love to know how they might describe you. Oh, that's, yeah, what a nice way to open. I'm not a, kind of a tangent here, I'm not a present person, but I love a birthday card, Mother's Day card, and the boys always put time into it. They're homemade and they have little pictures, even now, you know, they're 18 and 16, but the the overarching message they always write in the cards is, thank you for getting us into surfing, fostering a love of the outdoors, being a mum who always gets amongst it. So that, that's probably, if they were describing me, I'd, I'd say that, yeah. <laughs> Has that always been a part of your life before you were running this business? Did your adventure always form a part of your day-to-day? Yeah, very much so. I, as long as I can remember, mum would say that as well. I was always the first kid to jump in the water, jump into the rock pool, that, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I've always had it in me. My husband and I met at uni and after about a year and a half of working, we spent just short of 12 months in North America, literally just hiking around the national parks. And I think that just took me from beyond the ocean to mountains and camping and hiking and it just continued on from there. Oh, I have so much respect for that. I have my screensaver, one of which I can see uh, here in front of me, and it's the edge of a cliff in Malta. Mm. And it says, it's carved into the cliff that says you can do it. And then there's a second language next to it, which translates to it can be done. And I'll tell you, I stood at the edge of that cliff trying to jump off like the biggest chicken for so long. (laughs) Did you do it? I did eventually. Yeah. Only because I was hugely peer pressured by all the people around me. And it was the scariest thing. And I had the full adrenaline lip, you know, like the the trembles coming out of the water. And I keep it on my screensaver as a reminder to, to be brave. Even, even when you don't feel like being brave. So I have a lot of respect for that. Well, yeah, I, I'm saying I jump into rock pools, but it'd probably only be two metres high, nothing crazy. 
It's more that's about being in the water than the, than the free fall. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's high enough for me. Speaking of scary things, before, you know, you were kind of right in the thick of it with, with Muckmat, how did you end up at the precipice of this business? With no plan or intention, that's for sure. So my background is health science. So I've always been drawn to health and wellness. So I studied it. I spent probably just short of 10 years working with different specialists in diagnostic testing. So in cardiology, respiratory, lung function, sleep disorder. And that led me to the world of the pharmaceutical industry, where having had to sit into a, with a lot of of the pharmaceutical reps that would be explaining the updated medication, whose patients are suitable, et cetera. And yeah, I, I started to gain a real interest in that. So I moved into the pharmaceutical industry and there I was for 15 years. So learnt sales. I learned a lot about business and most importantly, people management. So that was people management was probably the last 10 years of my corporate career. And then we, we'd had the kids by then and life just was getting so busy. My husband travels a lot. I was traveling a lot for work and kids were still young and it was going nuts. So I decided to take a year without pay just to have a break and loved it. It's when I started surfing and just really, you know, slowed down. And yeah, so we decided after that year that I wasn't going to go back. So that, that was amazing. <laughs> and so, yeah, I had about four to five years of just being there with the boys and obviously a lot of beach time and been available and from that sprung muck mat where we were out and about traveling a lot the boys then were playing footy getting into mountain biking and it was just the constant battle with sandy gritty floors that not just parents can attest to it's just a, a thing you go outside and you, you pick up the grit so I just had a prototype of astroturf that I was using primarily in the car so we'd get out of the surf and be you know, sandy feet and getting changed out of our wetsuits. And so many people over a period of about six months would walk past and just say, what a great idea. Where did you get that? And initially I'd just laugh, no, I just made it up. Try it. It's great. And then, yeah, probably after three to four months, I said to Todd, I reckon every day someone comments on this mat. And then, yeah, it just stuck, kept playing over in my head, started to do a bit of searching. Is there anything like it out there? And there was nothing like it in Australia. So that kind of planted the seed and it was it was pretty much, oh, if I don't do something with this, someone else will. And the fact that we find it so helpful and it's catching people's eyes and imagination. So, yeah, I, as I said, I was in um, bliss land of just no work, surfing, yoga, kids, you know, raising boys is not easy, raising kids, it, you know, it, it had its challenges. But, yeah, I think going from full-time corporate, having young kids, husband that travelled a lot, I was a bit of, bit of Stress, to say stress, it was uh, yeah, an understatement. So that that's what led me to Mark Matt. And I imagine then standing on the on the edge and going, okay, let me explore this. Like, what was the first step? What lists did you make? You know, what actions did you take? Like, how do you go from this is a really cool thing that I've made myself to let's let's blow this up a little bit? Yeah, well, obviously I had no roadmap for it at all. So initially it was just the the fun basics of how are we going to do this, and then what are we going to call it, and what size are we going to make it. And then it was finding someone locally that could do it for us. So yeah, it's, it sounds so homegrown, but my dad came up with the name. <laughs> Love that. We had a friend of Todd's, my husband, who was a graphic designer and Toddy was just chatting to him and said, you know, Susie's thinking of this. And he literally within about 10 minutes said, How, how's this logo? And it's still the one we use now. So it was, I think when you don't have a lot of pressure or expectation, maybe it flows a lot easier. Finding a manufacturer was difficult because AstroTurf, not only tough to cut, but to bind, we put a marine grade binding around the outside and getting sewing equipment to actually bind through the grass was really difficult. So I went to a lot of upholsterers and marine upholsterers. So probably tried about oh, nearly 15 around the Gold Coast until we found someone in Corumban that primarily did rugs, carpet, and so they had the heavy duty equipment to be able to bind. So yeah, with them, we found a turf supplier in Yatla, which is just north of the Gold Coast, where we'd buy the rolls of turf and they'd cut and bind. It's really good because they had an established business. There wasn't really an expectation of 
minimum order or anything and it was around the corner so I could pop around and you know to begin with they'll probably I think our first order was only 100 maybe so it was really low risk and flexible and hands-on so we played around with a lot of different turfs and you know we, we since found out there's not just astroturf there there are so many varieties and so we, we it was finding the balance between it looking good and feeling good but also doing the job of getting the sand and grit off so yeah and then it was fun choosing the binding colors and yeah so once we were happy with the product we got it into the hands of a lot of mates a lot of adventurous mates surfers mountain bikers and the feedback we got was quite overwhelming they just loving it loving it just saying we are going to be your first customer it was just all positive which was great so yeah we, we knew we were onto a winner there and having tested it before we went to market was really important as well to iron out any any problems yeah so then designed a very basic website and went online just before Father's Day. So we timed it to be, you know, in line with a somewhat of an event that would create interest. And yeah, that was, that was launch. I think uh, the minimum order quantity situation is a like a, a moment for so many people who get into any kind of product-based business. I mean, what a fantastic way to approach it to go like, how can I go small and like find someone who doesn't quote unquote, like do this as yes. a, you know, as a, like a large scale business, you know, creating these things. It's like when you're you know, creating a, a beauty product or a body product. And if you're going overseas and you're going through Chinese manufacturers or anything oh, like sure. that moment when someone says to you like yeah no worries we can do this for you and it's going to be a really reasonable quant you know price per quantity but you have to get 50,000 of them it's yeah. just like it can stop Absolutely. so many businesses in their tracks I can see why and even um imagine like me a lot go in it's it's all foreign it's all new and even negotiating import tax and mm. container loads and not having a 3PL there'd be just I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have done it. No, I wouldn't. So yeah, low, low risk, low quantity. And like I said, the agility of being able to watch production as well for quality control, that was, that really just was, it was a great way to grow into the business as well without enormous outlay or stress. Yeah, such an important thing, uh, you know, I think for, for so many of us to remember, like try and find a way to to make something happen. I, I shouldn't even think I've even told this story before, but my partner and I explored um, a product, a product creation. We went down the road of having a custom recipe done and, you know, like going through that process and invested a bit. And the product that we were creating, we wanted it to be a certain type of packaging and it was definitely yeah. built around sustainability and mm. less quantity, higher volume. So we're reducing postage and things like that. And going through the process of then establishing, okay, we're going to need to buy at least 15,000 of these glass bottles that we wanted to have. And then at the same time, moving into a rental property and going, okay, so we now need a rental property that has a garage. <laughs> Yeah, this. Changes the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. So we've ended up like in a house now. Yeah, we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that product business. We explored it. We invested finances in it, but we realized we couldn't do it because it was too much of an investment and too much of a risk to to do it at this stage and to not have a 3PO and to try to, we were trying to do it on the cheap as well to, to test the market, but without reducing quality. And, you know, we couldn't do it for that product. It, it's such a, it can be such a painful process for, for people going through because you start to get a bit hung up on the idea and the potential of it. And, oh, if this takes off, you know, this yeah, could be fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's such a, yeah, such a scary, disappointing moment. But talk to me a little bit about 3PL because, I mean, I think now it's, it's talked about a lot more in, in business circles, like the understanding what that is and, and how it works. But what was your, I guess, decision-making process about deciding to go down that route? Breaking point, I would say. <laughs> so it, it Certainly wasn't part of the business for, I think, the first three, nearly three and a half years. So in the early stages, I would drive to the factory, pick up the finished goods, bring them back home. Um, same thing, our garage turned into a storage shed. And I had an Australia Post business account. So the, the orders would come through. Back then, I was manually typing or loading up the printing or the shipping label, I should say, printing them off packing them in the satchels, sticking, loading the car, I'd go to our local Australia Post. And as the business grew, that process grew. So sometimes I was driving to the, the factory twice a day, loading up the car, unloading mats, printing labels, got the boys involved, got one of my best mates helping. <laughs> yeah, it got to the point where it was just, I was spending so much time 
just with pick and pack and not on the business. And it's actually my dad, who's an accountant by trade, and he just said, this isn't sustainable and you've got to weigh up. Yes, it comes at a cost to use a 3PL, but that's going to free your time up to spend it on the, the big ticket items. And it, it was even really affecting just home life as well, because we'd finish dinner and then everyone's out packing mats for the night. It was but yeah, I, I think, I, and I'll say this, until you decide to outsource, you've got to feel the pain to a certain degree because the, the flip side is you outsource and suddenly you're not getting the orders to even cover your costs of using a 3PL. So yeah, it was it was probably a little late for me, but gee, when it happened, it was just so freeing. And how did it change your business then? Like, what did that look like in terms of your ability to grow once you outsource that? Yeah, good question. It it's a different kind of busy then. I also, up until all d- during that period as well, I was managing customer service as well. I had I was using an agency to help with Facebook ads, but doing my own email marketing. And so it gave me more time to look at, from an e-commerce point of view, the KPIs that drive growth. So around trying to increase the average order value, conversion rates, spend more time with the agency on ads sales periods, campaigns, and also started to branch into wholesale then as well. So it freed up my time to be able to not just service our existing inquiries for wholesale and the customers were starting to acquire, but also source new business as well. And so you you mentioned a couple of terms there, like, you know, conversion rate and average basket size, things like that, that, you you know, you say so confidently now, but it's, is it safe for me to assume that, you know, working in pharmaceutical sales, that wasn't necessarily (laughs) uh, something that you were super familiar with? Like, talk to me about that experience of learning this marketing language, learning this return on ad spend language, like all of this marketing experience. What was that like for you? Uh, Yeah, Kim, it's so safe to say I had no idea. I am never have been a big online shopper or a shopper in general and even with social media like personally I don't really use it a lot so all of it was new to me and I, I've said it often it felt like I was kind of doing a business diploma alongside learning this business so the number of things I've googled acronyms I've googled where a, a potential stockist would ask me questions and I'd I have no idea what they're asking and have to Google, what does that mean? So yeah, it, and even so that I'm learning absolutely every day and more so probably those website terms I just mentioned that it, because and we may get to this later, but it, it was a slow growth to begin with, but a, a growth to know I had a business there. And then it was an introduction of a different size muck mat and also coinciding with COVID and the caravan industry blowing up that the business took off. So probably for a good two years, it was just keeping up with growth really. So I, I wasn't really focusing on on anything to within the website to drive apart from the essentials making sure we had the you know the tools to convert sales but it wasn't until things started to level out that I started to then look okay I need to take a deeper dive into our ad spend and the return and you know the flow of the customer through the website all those things so yeah it's been a slow burn There are two truths about us business owners that both me and our incredible show partner, Card Dog Gift, know to be true. The first one is that we are some of the most generous humans on the planet. Maybe that's because we regularly have to push ourselves into uncomfortable spaces, learn to problem solve like crazy, and through all of that, we realize how impactful the generosity of others is. Whether that's people who've supported us directly through free advice and guidance, or indirectly by sharing their story and learnings on this pod. The second thing I know is we're also often stretched on time and headspace. So whether you struggle to find the perfect gift for your friends and family, have a last minute special occasion that you're not feeling ready for, or want to say thank you to your clients, team members or support team and still make it personal, card.gift have got you and here is how. You can get physical or digital gift cards for retailers like Adore Beauty, Apple, Netflix, Uber and more, like 150 plus more. They have beautiful designs on the cards and support local artists by featuring their designs. Love that. You can get a Visa, MasterCard or Eftpos gift card, which honestly just provides endless good feels for those you give it to. I personally love being able to get exactly what I want or just get myself some silly little treats like an overpriced smoothie and say a silent thank you to the human who gifted it to me. 
And you can even get hyper personal with them with a custom photo, a heartfelt message, or even a video message. And lastly, Card.Gift are the loveliest of teams. From their co-founder Nick to their marketing team of Lexi and Tash down in Melbourne, they're hardworking and care about what they do. And I value their support of this show so much as it helps me to keep supporting you to thrive. So next time you're being generous, type Card.Gift into Google and thank me later. Thank God for Google and YouTube yeah. and yeah. everything that we can can learn. It can be yeah. such an intimidating process, though, kind of staring down the barrel of the volume of things that you don't know. What was the the area in that phase that was the most intimidating for you through that growth period? Definitely Facebook ads. That's why quite early, well before the 3PL, I used an agency, a digital marketing agency here on the Gold Coast. So that was the best investment in the early days I made to help with even when things go wrong on the website. So I, yeah, I said we set up a pretty basic one, but I soon upgraded. Um, we moved across to Shopify. So the agency helped with that. They were then running the ads. I was doing the social media and that was another great outsource. As I mentioned, it's it's not my forte, it's not my interest. So I've got, yeah, a great girl who does my social media now. So that's that's really helpful as well. I think a lot of people would understand as well, back to Facebook ads, that it, it's a science in itself and it changes and you really have to, I'd say you really have to have a passion for it, but also keep on top of the changes because you can be throwing a lot of money at ads and not really knowing where it's landing. So that's where I'd much rather pay the, the specialists that are in it every day to manage that part of it. Yeah, I think it's a hard uh, a hard thing for us to let go of. You start to see a little bit of growth and then you're like, okay, what? How, who do I bring in? Who do I outsource? Who do I spend money on? You know, we hear so many stories of people investing in you know agencies or people and then it not mm. giving that return on investment. So it, it can be scary to let go of that. But you mentioned a little bit of it there, you know, the slow growth into higher growth, introduction of a new product, and then into that ability to be able to outsource. So could you talk to me a little more about that, I guess, financial side of that journey and you know those phases of like okay now it feels safe to be able to let go a little bit now it feels safe to be able to do this how did you manage that with you know keeping finances flowing through effectively the easiest way to explain that um never had a cash flow problem with the business so it was you know without percentages or numbers it was always knowing that there was enough in the pot to then use a percentage of that to outsource so no exact science around it was just knowing that I wasn't going to go into the red anytime soon for for getting extra help and knowing that that was an investment to grow the business further as well that was probably around the time as well another part of the business that I got help with was getting a business coach that was um, I mentioned before about the interest of retailers wanting to stock MuckMat. And I'd always thought initially it would be just an online direct-to-customer business, but start to get a lot of interest and Anaconda was the biggest one. (laughs) So I'd gone from, you know, setting a retail price with, I think I'd added three different sizes by then, but didn't have wholesale pricing, hadn't really thought about margins. So that was great getting a business coach that really helped get the numbers right back then as well. Because that, that's another problem that you can get yourself in. You you might be selling a lot, but if your margins aren't right, you might just be breaking even or, or priced wrong, whatever it may be. So, yeah. What did it feel like seeing Anaconda come into the emails? Oh, so good. I still I still remember it. It was <laughs> um yeah, it was the um, CEO that, yeah, he just, he emailed through the customer help <laughs> email at Muckman and just said, I had one of your mats, I bought one, I think he said I've had it for a couple of months and love it, love to talk further about if there's a possibility to stock it. Wow. So that was, um, whoo. <laughs> You never know what's going to turn up in your emails. You know, there yeah, are some days, yeah. well, there are days, months sometimes where it's like you could blow a tumbleweed through emails and I'm sure many business owners will relate to that where you're just like, it's just brutal and you're just like, this is this is kind of just going nowhere. And then just one day, one email can come mm. in and it changes everything. Have there been times where it's been that, that tumbleweed for you where things have just been like, oh, shit, what's happening here? Yeah, yeah, very much so. But yeah, probably more, as I said, probably after the boom of the caravan industry just going nuts and and people buying caravans and obviously buying accessories to fit them out. Absolutely, there are times. It's interesting when you you launch a product and you 
you think you've got your right target market, but that's changed a little bit as well. That That's probably where the tumbleweeds come and go, where, as I said, it started as a surfing product and that's how I thought it was, that was going to be it. So for surfers, beach goers, even thinking surf life-saving nipper families, which it well and truly has its place, but there's been quite a few outlets that are focused on surf that are interested, but you know, it's been a harder, harder sell, whereas the caravan and camping is just being the, the whole time, just the, the major market. And then we have a massive repeat business in Mark Maggot as well, where people might buy it for their tent caravan car, and then they come back for home and they want them for, you know, the doors around the house. So that's kind of initially never, never thought for home, but that's been, you know, a surprising growth area for Mark Maggot as well for home. And then a lot of people use them for pets. But yeah, to answer your question, uh, I, and so many people relate to this, you might think of a collaboration or a partnership or a retailer that would be interested and you, you know, get your pitch together and think, oh, they're going to love this and nothing, nothing. <laughs> I can definitely relate to that. And you know, I think so many of us can when it comes to, you know, like PR pitches and yeah, collab pitches and things like that. Has, has PR played a bit of a role in your, uh, in your journey? And, and what has that been like putting yourself out there? Yeah, it has. PR has been great from the beginning as well. Actually, a mutual colleague, friend, Odette, I came across um, Odette in the early days through a, a business mentor and had some really sound advice in the early days from Odette around you know, using PR as you know another media channel to, to get exposure, not just about your product, but just the business story. And whether or not Muckmat, because it's, it was first to market, there was no competitors. It gained a lot of interest in the media. So yeah, that that was a great platform. Yeah, a little leg up and it's continued to be as well. So it's stories about the, you know, the novel product and how it's helping adventure lovers and then the rise and growth of a almost like a kitchen table kind of business that came from a, an idea through to what it is now. You mentioned there are uh, no competitors and, uh, you know, in, in the early stages, like absolute dream for a small yeah. business owner to, to come into market and not see anything similar. Also, probably a scary moment when you think, okay, somebody could come into market, somebody with more runway or more money to throw at it. Has that happened for you? Or if it hasn't happened for you, uh, how do you cope with the concern and kind of protect yourself preemptively? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, it has happened to me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's been a learn as well that I've certainly learnt now that anyone who has, I don't, I won't just say product, probably services as well, service-based businesses, that it's inevitable, it's going to happen, it's just when. And I think last count, there's maybe nine competitors. Of course, the, the first couple hurt and it was also not just a copy, but almost like a cut and paste of our story, how it came about, exactly the same size, look, yeah. like, oh, and some on the Gold Coast as well. Oh, good, so, great. Oh, guys, <laughs> yeah, come on, just a, yeah, a little bit of initiative there. But, yeah, you've just got to stay in your lane, keep innovating, keep doing what you do well. The business and the, the brand's grown through community. We have an amazing support, loyal support, which has really helped just continue to cement it as the market leader. But yeah, I, I'm, I wouldn't say it's not frustrating, but, you know, it's kind of wasted emotion as well. There's nothing you can do about it. And yeah. Was there ever an option with trademarking with this sort of an idea? Because I mean, I know like, trademarking is kind of like a dark art. It feels like for a lot of businesses and a lot of products, you know, what can be done, what can't be done. Have you ever explored anything like yeah, that? Yeah. And I may not get the legal speak right here, but with the, the brand is trademarked and we looked at getting a patent for the actual product, but it, there wasn't enough percent of difference from just being an AstroTurf to, to get. And it, it's extremely expensive to go down that avenue to try and, and yeah, to, got a couple of different advisors legally around that. And they said, unfortunately, it's, it's not worth the time and the money because you probably won't be able to achieve it. That's probably the point where I thought yeah, we are exposed here and, and we have been. <laughs> How are you coping with that now? How are you, quote unquote, staying staying in your lane and just focusing on your own areas of growth and what's helping you personally through that experience? A lot of things. I think, as I said before, just staying in our lane and just making sure we are always ahead in terms of quality, customer service, range. That's from a product point of view. Personally, 
I keep going back to the why of why I started the business and it was was never to rule the outdoor mat market or I, I honestly, you know, in the early days as well, I think it's not about creating a business. It's just I represent a lot of Aussies that would have that, pro- like love nature, love getting out, love the beach and just are frustrated with sandy gritty floor tent caravan and so that brings me back to I'm that, that's the mission of the business it's in, inspire people to get outside without the worry of the mess and we continue to do that the best and that's the satisfaction I get from it and that comes through in the brand as well that it's more of a, a lifestyle than just a product. Yeah, I think so many of us can forget through this journey and often be told the reverse of some of what you just said, but you know, forget that our authenticity, you know, it's a word that just gets used and thrown around generally. But if you bring it back to how you just described it, the story of your authenticity coming through in the brand is that it is something that you genuinely used that made your life easier, better, that you have grown from. Like when we really lean into that, as opposed to, as you say, trying to take over the world, be the next tech bro, like just, you know, try to scale and sell and exit and all of these things. Absolutely. Or even like the competitors we have that saw, well, that's a product taking off. We'll do it as well. I, yeah, I think that's only going to take you so far, I think. And I don't know if this, this sounds a bit cliche, but because I surf most days, I still, every time I use it, the Mark fan, I just think, I'm so proud and love this product. <laughs> That's so important. It doesn't sound, you know, cliche or cheesy. Or like that you've got to find the love in in the business because there's so much of it that brings us down. Like, yeah, how unenjoyable to be driving to the factory, you know, twice a week and loading up the car and how heavy yeah. that must have been, like literally carrying it from car to yeah, car. Yeah, it sounds it was, awful. Was. You know, and having to then like get it back out and then, you know, going through having conversations with lawyers and going through having to throw money at Facebook and see them take it and think, thanks, sucks. Like, appreciate that. You know, didn't get the return. Like, all all of that journey, there's so many micro moments of pressure and frustration that, you know, you have to have that something that gets you through. Like having a business is not all like, yeah, look at me go. I'm having the best time. It is so many more of those, those moments you have to hold on to that joy. That's certainly been the driving force is just the feedback of customers over the years. It's what a difference it, it makes. Like, yeah, that keeps you going. Absolutely. Yeah, I so can relate to that. How has running this business changed you as a person? You've been in it six years now. I think at the time of us talking, that's that's quite a long time for a business. It sounds like you've had fantastic growth throughout and changes and 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 stresses. But how have has your personal journey through this period been? It's certainly a roller coaster, and I won't sugarcoat that either. As I mentioned before, when it was flat strap and I was doing most of it. Um, to the point where I'd have to say no to social events. I set my alarm at four o'clock to get up to start packing again. And as a sole business owner, you it's not just the physical business side, it's the emotional and the stress of th- things go wrong and a lot of things go wrong. And so, you know, there's a bit there where I felt like for a while it changed my personality, not not for the better. But now I've got more help and it, it's a much more balanced situation yeah, I feel like I'm back on track. But there, yeah, there were times where I thought, well, you could see how running your own business with all the the benefits that come with it. There's so many moments where I thought, oh, I'd do anything just to go back to a corporate where I had HR, marketing, (laughs) finance. I wasn't waking up at two o'clock every morning, worried. But yeah, the flip side is I'm super proud of what I've created. I walk the talk, so I make sure I allow time to surf every day go for a walk around the Burley Headland, available for my kids when when they're, you know, whenever I'm needed. Working from home is a joy. Yeah, and I've I've learned a lot. It's actually, you know, on the days everything's flowing well, it's a real joy. It's a my business is such an enjoyable part of my day. Yeah, there's so much of the time spent that's seasonal. I, I tried to touch on some of this in, in something I wrote a while back in Smart Company, but so many people who are leaving corporate to come into a 
business environment, they've got an idea and they want to have this experience of working from home, growing something you're really proud of, seeing it growing, be able to be financially independent, all of those wonderful things and expect that to happen, not not necessarily like quickly, but just get shocked unnecessarily or, or unfortunately get shocked by the season of hell that you have yeah. to go through in order to come out the other side. And not for every business and not for every person, but for so many, it's that that constant underlying fear of, am I going to have enough money to pay the bills, you know, this month, yeah, you know, even just absolutely. to pay the, the cost of maintaining the business, let alone your own personal bills. <laughs> you know, I laugh at that one because it's like, you know, that one's close to my heart at the moment. But, you know, you go through that experience of, like, yeah, waking up at extraordinary and going, I have no balance. You know, I thought I'd working from home and working for myself would give me more opportunities, more growth more balanced and, it, and it, it can but often you'll go through a season of hell where you're like this isn't what I signed up for. It's so true that's certainly where having business buddies helps a lot as well to realize that yeah ev- everyone goes through it and it, yeah you, you frame it right it's seasons it's, and seasons in one day as well. <laughs> oh yeah. You're having a great day and then at four o'clock something hits your inbox and not so great so it's probably also too just lowering your expectations that it's not all all roses that's for sure. That is definitely true. What do you know now, though, that you kind of wish you knew in those first, the early days, like the first 18 months where you were getting it off the ground in the manufacturing, but then even into that, like, oh, we're starting to see some sales now, we're starting to grow. What do you wish you knew then that you know now? Ah, Good question. I'll use an example, and it's probably around agreements. And this is the not a good seasonal time, the initial manufacturer that I spoke about that was making the mats for us for many years. They were looking to sell their business and I was their only customer at that stage. So as Muckmat grew, they started to phase out their other existing rug and carpet and and just concentrate on Muckmat because it was growing and growing and it was great for them. And then when they wanted to sell, because I was their only customer, you can imagine prospective buyer coming in, well, that's a pretty high risk manufacturing business to buy. They realized that it was going to be a challenge to sell. So here's an, Im- here's an email hitting my inbox that it was we've we've realised that we're in a challenging situation. We're not going to be able to sell this business. So what we're going to do is create our own version of Muckmat, undercut your price. My mouth is open. Yeah, and stop supply in the next six weeks. <gasps> so that. So can I translate that? They literally said, so uh, we're cooked in selling our business, so we're just going to steal yours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you what. Yeah. So to your question, I was naive in, as they were, I suppose, as well. We didn't have an agreement that they could not do that and stop supply. Yeah. So setting up proper contracts. Yeah. That's an unexpected joy of your own business there and and also mitigating risk that, yeah, it was a risk not only for them to only have me but for me to only have them as well without any contracts. I bet they're not on the Christmas card list anymore. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm a person that has never had animosity in my life so that was really, really unsettling and that, yeah, to deal with that. Todd, of course, my husband, extremely supportive, but not in the business. So it's kind of there, but uh, he's often like, I don't know how to help. (laughs) But yeah, happy, happily on the other side of that now. Oh my goodness. It must've been a very challenging uh, situation to to have worked through. Yeah. You can imagine having a contract like Anaconda as well. Did you go down the route of finding a new manufacturer at that stage? Was that when you, when you shifted over? We contemplated buying it really quite seriously and we were very close to, but realised as a family and even as a, a marriage, that wouldn't have been the right decision. It would just add to the load. But yeah, to cut, cut a long story short, I was, you know, in the depths of it and j- had just mentioned to a friend that oh, I've just had a bomb drop on me. And she said, oh, I wonder if my husband, he's been in manufacturing for years, maybe have a chat. He might be able to help you with a few things so had that chat which then turned into his interest in looking at the business and ended up buying it so oh, it was amazing. just oh I know couldn't have scripted that you just never know where things are going to take you in in this experience though and yeah you are going to find yourself in some legally challenging moments and you know heart heavy moments where people won't always do the right thing by you or you'll feel let down I mean I don't know about about you but like I'm quite a sensitive soul in that area there's not a lot of like there's fight in me for sure but 
I won't look for it, you know. I, I would quite happily avoid conflict <laughs> for the rest of my life. Yeah. And, you know, that is one area of business that surprises you. It can be with the manufacturer. It can be with so many providers that you have to deal with that are potentially impacting your business that you have to have these conversations with and it can, yeah, it can really challenge your experience. When it's not the way you think, it's it's beyond belief. It really, like I, yeah, it's still can't believe that happened to me actually but that's how my business coach has been really great in that she she helps me take emotion out as well and say yeah I can not in that instance but there's other things where she would say I can understand why they've done that because it's business and yeah but yeah you sound like me you just just want everyone to be happy (laughs) ideally so much better so where do you hope to grow now from the position you're sitting in today what's the what's the hopes for the future Lots of hopes, just with hopes with the balance as well. So I, as I said earlier, I've been through, you know, the the ups and downs and I feel like I'm in a really lovely flow state of you know, keeping my boundaries and making sure that the business is, you know, enjoyable part and of course profitable, but first and foremost, it's just having that lovely balance in life of family, friends and the things that light me up. International is the next phase while still continuing very much so to focus domestically, obviously caravan camping adventure, looking into North America and Europe. We've got a distributor in Germany that started with Muckmat. Oh, it was towards the end of last year. So we'll be ramping up that and looking at a second supply chain overseas as well, just to help with that load and then yeah into North America so hopefully we're able to replicate what we have for Australians that just selling that I said before the lifestyle of encouraging get out enjoy it and yeah add a few little luxuries along the way being a muck mat. I think the Aussiness of that you know of that side of the brand will go so well in that market. <laughs> yeah look you hope so don't you yeah and we're, we've been fortunate to do a lot of travel and continue and as I said earlier offline actually where my husband and I spent nearly a year in North America and just think of the opportunities over there so that that's that's a really exciting part as well now that we're, I think we've come across every challenge and problem and finesse the product and the range to what we need it and yeah start slow but um, already seeing quite an interest and it's amazing to share that you know going through all those process like we say you're six years in now so just you know intense setting for the listener depending on the stage that they're at for me for anyone you know listening that it, it quite possibly will take three years, six years, 12 years to be able to come that overnight international success that's in the future. And it's about going through that process and about that personal evolution to get there. Yeah. Also as well, I guess it's, you know, to all business owners to do it at your pace as well. Cause I, I found myself getting caught up in almost stressful periods or, you know, probably putting too much into the business and thinking, why am I doing this? And often it's for the expectations of others and particularly when you start to see success and people notice you and then there's that added pressure of, oh God, I've got to to keep this humming along. And so, yeah, I probably could have got places quicker, but there's always a cost of that as well. So I think if it's a three-year plan or a 10-year plan, it's, it's got to suit the owner as well. Oh, I mean, yeah, at the immediacy of the environment we find ourselves in sometimes, you know, what we see on the shortcuts of Insta or TikTok, you know, in terms of people's growth or, you know, the success stories that we see and we think, oh my God, I have to be there now. We do need to bring it back down to the individual and get a little bit quiet sometimes with that and, and make it work. I mentioned before about it. It's great to have business buddies for sure, but also not thinking, you know, if one's skyrocketing, that that's what has to be done. Like often it's quite the opposite. <laughs> Absolutely. It is a very, very personal journey, which is why we share so much of the scale of business here in this podcast, because yeah, it, it's, you know, you can take roadmaps from others, you can take insights from others, but at the end of the day, it comes down to your own personal journey and it's absolutely going to be whatever is going to be right for you. So how can we support you to get to the next stage of your growth? Because it, it is so generous to share, you know, so much of your story and your insight and where you've been and where you're going. Like you've just become a business buddy for the listener as well in that, in, in sharing your story. So how can we support you to keep growing? Oh, that's a lovely question, Kim. Do you know, I, I have this, uh, it's kind of an unofficial goal with Muckmat that I just want anyone who loves the outdoors to have least have heard about Muckmat. They don't have to own one, but they've they've got the option to check it out. And if they want one, they want one. But yeah, my, my example is walking through a caravan park and you spot a lot of them. I think if everyone at least knows about it, I'm happy. <laughs> 
I love that. <laughs> well, we're going to do a little bit of a job of that for you. I will put the link to your socials and your website in the show notes so that listening can go after hearing about it, go check it out. Do check it out and visualize it. Like I think when I saw like the mats on the stairs of the caravan, I was just like, shit, that's ingenious. Like <laughs> just to, you know, follow like the kids as they run in their caravan, it's like clean feet, clean feet, clean feet all the way in. There. Yeah, I know. Um, it is pretty cool. It is really yeah, it baffles me. It's a, it's a very simple idea, but it, it's a solution to a common problem. And, you know, that that's often the success of a lot of product businesses that, yeah, yeah you're solving a problem and it, it's often a simple daily problem. Absolutely. And it's often like the most random of small things as well that you would never think of. I had a guest um, previously, his name's Mike. He's got a business called Scratch, which is in pet food. And he's created an innovation around, you know, order as you go pet food. And you know, he describes his industry as boring. And he's like, there's so much growth potential in the boring industries because people don't look at it yeah. and they don't see the opportunity. But that's where, you know, often so much growth is and there's the small things that you think, oh, like no, people aren't going to be interested in that. And it's like, no, that's actually amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. If you said to me 10 years ago, you're going to be, you know, mat industry, like what? <laughs> no way. <laughs> but, you know, you can create a brand and a business and a lifestyle yeah. out of the things that, that matter to you. And it's such a cute brand. Your dad did an amazing job with the name. And, you know, it's it's an incredible product as well. So um, thank you so much for being here with us on the pod today to share your story. And I'm so excited to watch you grow internationally and just keep going. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out and I'll see you there.